you, everyone. Again, Dr. Palumbo with the Adult Reconstruction Team at Florida Orthopedic Institute. All right, so again, my topic is uh, partially arthroplasty, uh, trying to gear this towards the primary care physician is a topic near and uh, dear to my heart. Um, um, these are my relevant disclosures. Uh, so the objectives of the talk are to discuss uh, knee arthritis uh, clinically and radiographically, uh, define what unicompartmental, arth unicompartmental knee arthroplasty is and its role in uh, reconstruction, uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, indications and patient selection, which is really the bulk of this talk. I think with partial knee arthroplasty, uh, probably the most important aspect of achieving good outcomes is really patient selection, uh, and then talk a little bit about outcome and uh, survivorship. So of course, as you probably know, knee arthritis um, or osteoarthritis is that wear and tear type of arthritis of the knee joint. Uh, it really is a rather complex biochemical and mechanical uh, process in which you get degradation of the hyaline cartilage throughout the knee. I will talk mostly about a varus knee, so um, just for simplicity, but in the varus knee, typically uh, this will begin anterior medially. It progresses posteriorly with time and, and as the wear progresses until you get involvement of the intercondylar notch. Uh, and development of notch osteophytes. Along with a pro-inflammatory state, you get uh, a milieu for chemical and mechanical uh, ACL degradation. Uh, once you get uh, ACL or the ACL becomes insufficient, you get progression of arthritis to the contralateral compartment and, um, and subsequent tricompartmental arthritis. And we're trying to capture those knees with, 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 regards, with regards to patient selection uh, before they progress uh, to uh, tricompartmental arthritis. So here on the left, you'll see uh, you have a normal knee, healthy joint space, about typically about six millimeters of joint space in the medial and lateral compartments. And on the right, you have a, uh, an, an osteoarthritic knee with tricompartmental arthritis. You have bone on bone um, wear pattern medially and a su subtle subluxation of the femur on the tibia with progression of lateral compartment disease. So again, these are the, this is really the, what we're trying to capture is before they progress to, um, to tricompartmental arthritis, with arthritis with degradation of the ACL. You have isolated medial compartment disease in this case and preserved lateral compartment. Cases where you have severe uh, femoral or tibial bone loss with severe deformities, these are obviously not uh, cases where you can consider a partial knee. Uh, total knee arthroplasty is going to be, continues to be the gold standard for knee arthritis, even in the case of isolated um, uh, medial or lateral tibial femoral disease. I think the challenge with total knee arthroplasty and what we've, what we've learned over the last um, decade or so is that um, our, our patients are, are achieving higher degrees of, of uh, performance into the elder, uh, elder years, uh, and their, de their demand is really increasing. And uh, th this was really outlined uh, by Phil Noble, but uh, outcomes and satisfaction rates with total knee arthroplasty are somewhat limited, at least they have been over the past few decades. And, and he, uh, he wrote this paper in uh, 2006, uh, evaluated over 250 total knees and found uh, that about 15% of patients were dissatisfied. And I think that has a lot to do with uh, surgical technique and experience. This is a heterogeneous uh, uh, patient data set, but it's important to understand with total knees were somewhat limited, and that's why you're seeing this, this rise in things like robotics and uh, custom implants and, and navigation to try to accommodate for that. Partial knee arthroplasty is really another option to probably maintain a more natural uh, feel or proprioception to the knee and, and have a better outcome uh, overall. It's really defined as the isolated medial uh, or lateral tibiofemoral resurfacing or, or, or also it would be considered a patellofemoral resurfacing, but we're not going to discuss that today. Uh, certain benefits um, are improved function uh, over total knee arthroplasty. Uh, decreased rehab time and recovery time versus total knees. Cruciate, uh, cruciate preservation will maintain a more natural knee kinematic pattern and proprioception for the patient. And, and of course, this is a bone preserving um, procedure relative to a total knee. Uh, here's an illustration on the, uh, on the right. You'll see that this is a partial knee. It's a medial compartment uh, arthroplasty. The patella femoral and lateral compartments are preserved. And on the left, you'll note the, uh, uh, the total knee, which in all, all three compartments are resurfaced. And also, it's very important to note that the ACL is preserved with the partial knee, which is really a paramount uh, in this type of surgery. 
So if it's so good, then why shouldn't everyone uh, get a, a partial knee? Because there really are some limitations, and, and again, we're going to get into that with, um, with regards to indications and patient selection. In my practice, what I found is I have kind of a dichotomy. I have uh, one set of patients that will come in, they know I do partial knees, they want a partial knee, they want their perfect outcome, quick recovery, uh, and uh, they don't want to hear about the downside to it. And then I have another uh, patient subset who just, you know, has read about partial knees. They, you know, read what's on the internet, some bad experiences, and they just don't. They, I mention it, and they just want to slap me. And those are not the. You know, those are certain patients that you may not even want to consider doing it anyway. On uh, the truth is really in the middle, and it involves a shared decision uh, decision making with the patient. Um, on one hand, you have this possibility for early failure in a secondary surgery and this issue of persistent pain, which is somewhat complex and controversial, but it's certainly an issue. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have uh, as the things that we've mentioned, the benefits, improved function, proprioception. It's a bone-preserving um, procedure, lower perioperative risk of complications, and faster recovery. I always tell the patients the stars have to align in order for this patient to be the right procedure for you. Uh, it has to be the right knee, the right patient, and the right surgeon. The surgeon, uh, surgeon experience is critical with this type of procedure because technically it's, it's, it's harder to, to, to nail this than it is a total knee, and total knee has a little bit of a fudge factor to it. Uh, this does not. Again, ind indications by far the most important factor to achieve good outcomes with this type of procedure. Uh, we'll discuss those now. So the, the uh, Cozen and Scott criteria initially published in 1989, subsequently modified. I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Scott the, uh, in fellowship. Um, just to talk about it, a few of the indications. So isolated medial or lateral compartment arthritis, as you can see here with the varus and valgus a knee pattern. Uh, weight less than 82 kilograms or 180 pounds. Arc of motion uh, greater than 90 degrees with less than 5 degrees of contracture and angular deformity less than 15 degrees, which is passively correctable. So a case like you see on the right with severe varus deformity and, and, um, and uh, probably instability uh, noted on x-ray, these are cases that you just can't do a partial knee on and it's just, they're not candidates and you shouldn't consider them. Patellofemoral arthritis, we'll discuss a little bit more about this in, in the future slides, but just know that it's, it's for the most part a contraindication, I would say a relative contraindication, but certainly uh, needs, to be uh, needs to be considered. Uh, and then inflammatory arthritis or uh, things like rheumatoid, psoriatic, those are, those are concerns and those are not, um, those are uh, contraindications to a partial knee. When you, when you evaluate a lot of these indications, I think it's, you'll find that these indications really are pointing towards um, not overstressing the implants. Uh, these implants um, are, are not as robust as uh, totally arthroplasty components, uh, specifically the tibia. This is the weak link of, uh, of the surgery. Uh, in, when you look at a, uh, a totally arthroplasty tibia, for instance, you'll note that there's a large area, a large surface area for fixation. It's covering the entire tibia. You generally have large keels, sometimes even stems. You can modify the implant to have stems to improve fixation in the large, in the large patient. With partial knees, you're much more limited. It's about one-third the surface area. You have generally just usually a, sm a few small pegs and maybe a small keel for fixation. So the, the, the ability for these implants to stay fixed in, um, in certain um, uh, quality of bone uh, with certain patient types, like large patients, it's not as good and, and it's subject to early failure. And that's why indications are so important. That's why the, those indications are kind of gearing you towards a specific patient subset. Uh, to talk about the subsets, young patient, really important one. Um, originally, this was a contraindication in the Cozen and, and, and Scott criteria, but that really creates a, um, a conundrum because this is, a, again, as we mentioned earlier, this is a procedure in which we're, it's bone preserving, it's improved function uh, and, and proprioception relative to a total. These patients, are, if they have a partial knee, their ability to return to discretionary activities like jogging, cycling, golfing is going to be greater. So ideally, that would be the, the, the perfect candidate, you know, the, young, the young patient. But unfortunately, uh, this, this um, uh, possibility for early revision is, is very real and, and pronounced in the literature. When you look at Swedish registry data, um, total knee arthroplasty and, and partial knee arthroplasty survivor, uh, survivorship, you'll note here with total knees, this is 2009 data, but uh, in, the, in the beige area, the total, the total knee survivorship in patients under the age of 55 at 10 years is appro approaching 8%, you know, pretty good survivorship in the young um, patient cohort. Unfortunately, when you look at 
that same beige area, which represents the younger patient at uh, 10 years, uh, the chance for, for revision is approximately uh, 25%. Uh, and it, it's important to note that this, this type of data set is a heterogeneous group of uh, surgeons and patients. So there are, there are surgeons with varying levels of, uh, of expertise. You can have general, general uh, orthopedic surgeons. They're not all orthoplasty surgeons. They may not be high volume partial knee surgeons. But the important point here is to note that for all comers, generally speaking, partial knees in younger patients don't last as long. Um, now, this was, again, my mentor, Dr. Scott. Uh, we, we evaluated his data and um, presented it in uh, the academy in 2014. And you'll note at 25 years, we achieved 75% survivorship, which is really rather good. And this, these are patients under the age of 56. Uh, so I think this, this kind of points to the fact that with uh, good technique, meticulous technique, and experienced surgeon, you can achieve excellent outcomes in survivorship, uh, even in young patients. So it's, again, it's a bit of a dichotomy there, but the heavy patient. So again, we're talking about overloading or overwhelming that implant, so keep in mind uh, that concept. But uh, obviously, these patients are going to present early in, earlier in life just because they're loading their joints more. Uh, and then, of course, when you implant a component such as a, a to, um, an arthroplasty, or in this case, a partial knee, uh, there's going to be a propensity for early implant loosening and polyethylene wear. So you have to be concerned. <coughs> Uh, there are, there are um, many reports in the literature, both um, uh, both supporting uh, partial knees in the obese population, uh, BMI greater than 40, and refuting it. So, uh, in my in my synthesis of the literature, the way at least I I kind of perceive things is that the obese and inactive patient probably can achieve good survivorship. Uh, and then the uh, obese and active, I get, con I get more concerned about. But again, that's, again, my kind of synthesis of the literature. You have literature both supporting and, and refuting uh, this, this concept. I think with the mesomorphic male or the large muscular guy, um, it's, it, it, these are the, 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 uh, the patients I, I do become rather concerned about. Uh, these are weightlifters, joggers, runners, very active individuals uh, putting a large load and a large demand on the implants. I, I, for, for the most part, don't offer these patients partial needs for that reason. I'm concerned about early loosening and failure. Or at least they have, to have, they have to have the expectation and understanding that these, these implants would um, possibly fail early. So ACL deficiency is an important point. Again, it has to be the right knee. Uh, for all intents and purposes, an ACL deficient knee is, 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 an, is a contraindication to a partial knee. It's important to understand this concept that with ACL uh, deficiency or insufficiency, you get uh, posterior translation of the femoral condyle onto the tibia. Uh, in the case of a native knee, this is going to cause a posterior wear pattern relative to the anterior medial wear pattern we discussed earlier. Uh, so it does present a little bit differently radiographically. After a partial knee arthroplasty, this is going to result in posterior translation of the femoral component, and that's going to result in loading of the implant in, uh, in a, in a uh, um, in a rocking course uh, phenomenon, the implant can potentially loosen early in these cases. And it's important to understand that these are not good candidates for partial knee arthroplasty. There, are, uh, there is substantial evidence supporting this concept of uh, partial knee arthroplasty and concomitant ACL reconstruction. Um, this is Simon and Weston, I'm sorry, Weston and Simons, uh, and published uh, excellent uh, satisfaction and survivorship in 52 simultaneous uh, ACL uh, UK reconstructions. Uh, this is definitely an option. Uh, this is a uh, fluoroscopic analysis um, uh, published by Pandit and colleagues uh, evaluating uh, partial knee arthroplasty with concomitant ACL reconstruction. I think the important point here is that it returned uh, the knee kinematics uh, to, to, the, to simulate the native knee with a partial knee and ACL reconstruction. So it's really rather impressive that with these types of procedures, you can re restore the native knee um, uh, kinematics um, uh, fairly well. Patellofemoral arthritis. So if you see this in the clinic, you know, is the patient um, a candidate for partial knee? I would say in most cases, if it's advanced radiographically, it's, it, it's probably a contraindication. There is literature support that you, could, you can potentially uh, ignore this. Uh, my experience, uh, and, and probably most sur uh, surgeons would suggest that if you have either moderate or worse uh, patellofemoral arthritis, that these patients are not candidates for partial knee arthroplasty. Uh, the, just to briefly discuss this concept of dual compartment medial uh, patellofemoral joint arthroplasty, there are several implants in the market. Um, I, in, my, in my view, these are rarely indicated. I published on uh, one of these implants in 2011. It was fraught with <coughs> 
uh, really poor clinical results and even catastrophic failure in several cases. Uh, and in my, in, in my, uh, in, in my, um, in my, in my hands, this is just not even a consideration. Um, so just to touch on implant pearls and uh, some technical pearls briefly, uh, I think the, the point regarding implants, that this is a, a significant factor. There's a lot, there are probably a multitude of different geometries and implants in the market. Uh, there are really only several tried and true implants with long-term track records. Uh, some of the work we did uh, years ago evaluated geometries of specific base plates and found that certain base plates had higher intrinsic stress and, and micromotion than others, and this, this, these directly were associated with, um, with uh, good or, or poor clinical outcomes, specifically in the registry data. So implant design is really uh, rather important and shouldn't be ignored and shouldn't be, shouldn't be just using any implant on the market. Uh, brief technical pearls, I think surgically, uh, a lot of surgeons want to uh, maintain a minimally invasive approach with these surgeries. Uh, somewhat contradictory because you know, obviously you would like to uh, have less soft tissue disruption. On the other hand, it, it's more important to implant these components correctly. So if you're malaligned, these implants are going to fail rather quickly. Uh, specifically with regards to the tibia, it has to be perpendicular to the coronal axis uh, and then in line with the native slope on, on the uh, sagittal view. Uh, various positioning in these implants, as I mentioned before, very uh, not well tolerated at all. It will result, uh, result in early failure and loosening. And things like overhang, as you can see here with the tibia, will, will also result in a persistent pain and loosening. Uh, last point here, technically, um, you know, when performing these uh, or when implanting these components, if you overstuff or make that compartment too tight, it can translate those forces to the contralateral compartment, resulting in early wear and a progression of arthritis. So it's something to be to be uh, cognizant of. So in summary, I think partial neoarthroplasty is a fantastic operation. Uh, in, there's definitely improved recovery, uh, improved proprioception, a more natural feel relative to a total knee, mainly because you're preserving that ACL. It's, it's definitely bone preserving. Uh, so for the young patient, although there's a higher risk for failure, is also the benefit of preserving bone. Um, the early failure is very real. It's dependent on age, activity level, surgeon's preference, the size of the patient, and then, uh, patient, you know, of course, patient selection. Uh, and as we discussed, be cautious with the young, obese, and active. Uh, with, uh, ACL tears, contraindication, patellofemoral arthritis, for the most part, contraindication. Thank you. Look forward to answering any questions you have.